Legends of Media Research is a podcast series featuring interviews with the media industry's leading researchers, where we go behind the scenes, sharing stories from their greatest achievements and challenges. Brought to you by Media Science, the leader in media and advertising innovation research. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information about media science. But for now, I'm your host, media science CEO, Dr. Dwayne Veron. Welcome to another exciting episode of Legends of Media Research. Now, in our last episode, Bruce McCall, the former CMO of Mars, talked about how our next guest challenged and ultimately transformed his worldview, resulting in an approach to marketing research that was far more grounded in scientific evidence. So naturally, it only makes sense that this week we're going to follow up and introduce you to that culprit, <laughs> to the director of the world-famous Ehrenberg Bass Institute, Byron Sharp. Byron and I are something of metaphorical twins. <laughs> we both started academic research centers at relatively lesser known cities in Australia, you know, in Byron's case out of Adelaide, in my case out of Perth, around the same time. Byron had a focus on bringing science and marketing together. I had done the same thing with the media and science kind of like focus. We both ended up in the same playground with advertising. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. What's ironic about this is that these centers that we both created became global research centers of excellence in both of our spheres, attracting most of the Fortune 500 companies ultimately as sponsors, something that elite American universities uh, find hard to do. In fact, most of those initiatives ultimately fizzle. And so the fact that these two centers out of Australia were so successful and still are, uh, in Byron's case, I mean, mine, I retired in 2015, but Byron is still up and running and and doing great and growing from strength to strength every day. So it's great. Now, the irony of it is that when I say metaphorical twins, the reason I say that is we started these centers at the same time. We had similar profiles in terms of what we built. And now, ultimately, in the latest uh, global rankings of advertising research, Byron and I came out equal seventh. So we both tied. <laughs> so that's truly ironic. And in fact, um, Byron, in your case, an extra congratulations, because in that exercise that had been done a decade earlier, the ranking of, of global academics and advertising 10 years earlier, it was actually uh, Andrew Ehrenberg who ranked seventh. And so you oh, truly really? have, okay, yeah, right, right. Okay. so you're truly oh. a successor. <laughs> okay. oh, very good. Now, for the benefit of the audience, we're talking here about Andrew Ehrenberg, who Byron's Research Center is, is partially named after. Andrew is another legend, uh, an early pioneer of an approach to marketing research that was truly grounded in science, looking for repeatable and replicable patterns. So Byron, how did you and Andrew start collaborating together and how did that evolve into the growth of your research center out of, out of Adelaide? Actually, I'll tell a funny story. I mean, I, I read Andrew Ehrenberg's stuff when I was a, a master's student where I read anything that had the word of brand in it. And I actually, I remember putting most of his articles, I put a little side folder, which I sort of marked as, oh, this stuff I think is really important, but I don't really understand it because it's so different. <laughs> but afterwards I got, I started to realize this was, this was proper science. I think someone suggested that I, I, I started a journal that was about, doing replications and things in marketing, you know, retesting studies and seeing where they generalized. And someone suggested, why don't you ask Andrew if he'd be on the editorial board? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Or, I don't know if I wrote a letter or email or something, but he responded immediately. Um, and then we started collaborating. Rachel Kennedy, I think, went over for about half a year in, in London. And, you know, Andrew had been funded by industry all his life because he, 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 you know, he worked as a, as a, so sort of consultant research was a little um, sort of marketing analytics agency. Uh, and then he became, but he published while he was doing that. And so when London Business School, I think was their first marketing professor, they looked around and they saw this guy, and they went, you know, you come be our marketing professor. And he was like, okay, but I haven't actually, st I don't actually have a degree in marketing. <laughs> I've just sort of fallen into it. And they're like, well, you, you publish good stuff. Um, but he, but he quickly went. I'm not a very good teacher. <laughs> Is it okay if I just do research? And they went, oh, well, if you can fund it. And and so that's when Andrew reached out to industry and um, 
said, you know, I I will I will write reports, you know, on findings for you. Can you can you fund me a bit? And that was what was called the R, became called the R and D initiative in marketing. And and Andrew asked me if I could take over that. And he was pretty sure that I would move to London, um, which I was not going to do. And I said, no, I, th- I think we can. I think we can run it from from Adelaide. Um, and uh, I, I remember Andrew explaining to his like dean of research that he said, uh, you know, I, I run. The, I've got a few people. You know, they're all retired and they're working with me. And uh, Byron's got on and down in Australia. He's got sort of the opposite of that. And the dean went, well, opposite of retirement home. Well, a kindergarten. <laughs> And we were, we were very young and uh, <laughs> self, self-taught, but we had that same ethos of doing, doing, you know, it, you know, we, we peer review our questions a lot. Like, you know, is that, is that, is, is that worth, you know, particularly when we're giving a topic to a new master's or PhD student, you know, I feel there's an ethical thing of like, no, just because this is fashionable in the literature or something at the moment, you're going to spend three years of your life on this. Are you going to come out with some findings that if you stand up on a stage in an industry conference, people are going to say, oh, that, that's interesting and useful. Not, oh, well, that's very academic. So we peer review and make sure that we, you know, we're studying important things. And so that, yeah, that ethos has undermined everything. And, uh, you know, we believe in advertising and we've got more and more famous and therefore we're supported by corporations all around the world. It's a great story. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable that more university centers haven't tried to emulate your model. You have a successful model. You would think that there would be more appetite and, and ambition for kind of like replicating that model. People love the idea. We'd love to have sponsors. You have, you have people who just support, they just give you money. What, they give you money every year and they don't, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. That, oh, we'd love to do that. And I go, well, that's fine. Just make some discoveries. And then go out to an industry conference, stand on stage and just tell them discovering if it's a worthy thing, you will find people are very happy to support you. But of course, that's the problem. They haven't got discoveries. So much of the work that you've done, and we'll talk a little bit about this throughout the podcast, but you've done a lot of work that is disruptive, you know, that has, that has taken convention and that's challenged convention. And I feel that often academics are just reinforcing the convention. They're just trying to find, you know, more support for something that's already kind of like assumed in the market rather than really testing and and kind of like challenging some of the the, the prevailing views it's hardly research is it if you sort of know the answer before you start. <laughs> we are asked, often asked about that like why why so many you know shocking findings and uh, i point out that, that that that's that's quite normal for science i i would struggle to name a single scientific finding of any you know importance that well we all believe it now and it's common sense now but if you think about beforehand you go no nah, that that's really weird right uh, yeah. germ theory right the, the fact that diseases are spread by tiny microscopic things that we can't see if you told a victorian that they'd like no it's by bad smells we know that like, you know. It might help the audience if we use a concrete example. So I'll, I'll help, uh, yes. I'll help prime this with an example. You know, well, when what I do you think the most shocking, what do you think? The most well, one of the Aaron things that I think was really shocking is I remember one of our clients required us to go through their brand school. This is, yeah, I won't name them specifically, but this is one of the largest marketeers in the world. You know, definitely somebody that everybody would look up to in terms of, you know, this is where you would find the way to do good marketing. And as part of the background to the project, our team had to go through their brand school. And I remember that in the brand school, probably the central, most important thing you learned was the application of the Pareto principle, you know, that there's 20% of the market, which represents 80% of your value. And so that is the group that you should target. So good advertising is about finding that 20% and going after that 20% and communicating with that 20%. Forget about the 80%, the 80%, no value, that 80%, you know, not worth the effort, focus on the 20%. That's where you're going to maximize your, your effect. And, and of course, that view is still prevalent in a lot of circles. And then of course, these Ehrenberg Bass people come along <laughs> and they turn that, that, that assumption on its head by you know, correctly pointing out, where does your growth come from? Is your growth gonna come from that 20%? 
So, you know, maybe you can you can speak to this, well, uh, first, this principle. Well, yeah. Well, well, first of all, we just look to say, you know, like is two questions. First of all, is is this because we're very interested in scientific laws, the patterns that, that hold across lots of conditions, because this gives you power. You can't make predictions without you know, no. So, you know, the great thing is that, you know, you, you can be an engineer and you can go to Mexico, you'd be based in Mexico, say, and you get transferred to South Africa. And you don't have to go, well, what's, you know, South African gravity like, you know, <laughs> well, you know, is escape velocity different here than it? You don't, you know this. Um, and so the fact, things that repeat across wide range of conditions, we're very, very interested in. So, Pareto law sounds, it sounds like it could be that. So, but we first of all, what is it? Is it, you know, reliably that, that the top 20% give you 80% of your sales volume? Is there a, something that generalizes across categories? And then is it, is it truly 80, 20? And what we found is, um, yeah, it is actually quite generalizable. It, it's, it's pretty predictable because lots of different cases, there isn't that much variation and what variation there is, you know, we, we know, we, you know, we know mathematically how to predict that. It's not, it's not huge, but it's not. Your top 20% gives you about half and your bottom 80% gives you about half of your sales. And yeah, that is quite a, you know, that's like a huge shift in thinking because because if, if I, as a brand manager, heard that 80% of my customers only give me 20% of my sales, I'm like, well, they're pretty low priority. I'm not going to worry too much about them. But if you tell me that that 80% give me half, then I'm like, well, uh, you know, who wants to walk away from half their sales? I, I don't think so. And then if you tell me, oh, and that 80%, they give you about half now and next year it will be more. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. And recently, which, which you know, isn't public domain at the moment yet, but you know, we've been studying category growth. But you know, you realize that if you want to grow a category, you know, like if you're a big player in the category, and so you know, your sales depend more on category growth than it does on share growth. What has to happen for the category to grow? Well, it means people who do not buy the category at the moment, who are worth nothing, okay? well, not even potentially something that they could buy, you know, be part of your market share. They do not. They're not in the market. They do not buy the category. They have to buy the category for the category to get bigger. And then it's like, oh, right. So, so suddenly targeting my advertising to my top 20% looks pretty anti-growth. And oh. that particular principle, I think, had shockwaves in the industry. Again, because if, you're, if you have a convention that everybody accepts as gospel, and then somebody comes along and, and challenges it, and particularly challenges it with evidence, which of course invites the question, well, okay, well, let's go look at our evidence. And and then mm. suddenly you start to question, well, does, is that really what our evidence has been saying? You know, like, yeah. like it, it, it well, the terrible thing about 80, 20, 80, 20 textbooks would teach it without showing any data. So authors just wrote this and you're like, well, but have you ever looked at, have you ever looked at the data? Have you ever looked? Oh, no. So if you're at an organization that still applies the Pareto principle to your targeting, I think uh, based on Byron's advice, you'd be good to look and explore what the real numbers are rather than just accepting that as a principle you know um, is it really the fact that your top 20 percent of customers are giving you 80 percent of your value or is it more like like 50 percent and um and then of course also ask yourself the question where your growth is coming from but a great example again of of, of where we're challenging or not just accepting uh, industry conventions So you 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 built a center together with your colleagues that was um, applying empirical generalization, you know the ability yeah, so to searching to, so searching for repeatable patterns. Yes. Yep. Yep. Searching for those repeatable patterns and and drawing those scientific laws that you could apply to to many circumstances. But of course, a lot. I mean, while much of that was published, there was a lot of that that was happening kind of like you know, within the confines of the community of sponsors that you you built who were gaining access to those insights before they were published. But I think the big turning point for the Institute really probably came with your your book, uh, How Brands Grow. Yes, that was that was a big yeah, yeah, step onto the global stage, I suppose. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people within your community of sponsors, of course, knew what you were doing yep. and were really impressed. But the world at large hadn't yet discovered that. And then you you wrote your book. I, I, of course, because I, I know you personally, and I know a little bit of the story. Maybe 
you know, you, you really were a reluctant author, which is very <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, unconventional for an academic, uh, but you were really a reluctant author of the book. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit of the backstory about yeah. Yeah, how the well, book came well, to be. <laughs> yes, it is a, it's a humbling story. The Institute has advisory boards in North America and Europe and Australasia, and it might have been the European board who, who started this, and then the Americans endorsed it. Um, and that, you know, they said, we need you to write a book to help us in the transformation. Um, well, actually, first of all, they told us something that was quite shocking. Well, it was shocking to me. They said, we don't actually sponsor you for the reports, <laughs> for the new reports. <laughs> I was like, what? They went, no, 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 no. You, you've got to keep doing that. You've got to keep making discoveries. But the real, but the real reason we sponsor you is just to be close to the thinking, close to the research, and for you to help us on this transformation as we try to pull these principles into the organization and, and, and change practice. And so it's a sort of a journey from sort of anything goes marketing to, to evidence-based marketing. And, and we need to be close to you to do that. And you need to help us. And one of the things you could do to help us would be, could you write a book on, on, on the, just the, 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 the early fundamental findings, you know, and what they mean? And, you know, something that we could give to the CEO and say, we're making changes in marketing, you know, again, <laughs> but, but this time there's some science and rigor behind it. Okay. So, you know, it should be a hard back and you should have a nice prestigious publisher and things, which, which is why, you know, we have Oxford University Press. So I always joke, they're not, they're not too shabby as a, as a publisher. So that, you know, that was, that was the brief, you know, do, do this hardback book that covers the early and the, I mean, Alka, who was the uh, commercial director, but she's executive officer on the on the board. She sort of rolled her eyes, going, "Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to do that." Because, <laughs> you know, she knew we were, we were you know, typical academics, you know, always on the new things and writing new uh, papers, and and, uh, and wouldn't want to wouldn't want to do that hard slog. And so we did. But the, the problem is, if you have a board, an advisory board, and they give you good advice, you you have to follow it. So uh, it took about three years of writing. Fortunately, you know, a lot of material was honed by, by doing presentations to sponsors. So some, some of the, you know, book chat business came off keynote slides that had been, had been, so I knew I had the material and I thought probably is good that this is written up. It, it, it won't be a bestseller or anything, but it'll be the sort of book that, you know, sells for many decades. That, that's what I thought. So, you know, I got everything wrong, really. <laughs> <Or cross -forecasting. laughs> so because, it, yeah, it really surprisingly took off. Um, and I guess I guess that's that's about what you said before that just some of the things were a bit shocking, and so people had to had to find out they had to read this book even if it was to later burn it or something you know you know the original digital I'll read this and then burn it, but it started it's it started you know a, a bit of a revolution and change the institute. Byron, you you cover a lot of ground, of course, in the book and in the larger body of work that the institute has done, and that that really covers the full marketing gambit. Um, but of course you deal specifically with advertising within that larger framework, if you will. Maybe you can share with us some of the things that you've learned uh, over the decades now of research that, that, that the Institute has been doing about how advertising works. What, what has the Institute discovered about how, uh, how successful advertising works? Well, unlike you, Dwayne, we, we were not advertising people. Um, so, you know, our background was studying buyer behavior and brand performance. So when we started, we I think, did the right thing, I think, which is, you know, you should, you, if you're not in, from the industry and stuff, you should be humble, first of all, and just go and check. Because, I, you know, I did not want us doing sort of some research and then standing up and so in front of someone like you and you going, oh, yeah, we did that. 15 years ago like you know that's no one <laughs> so the first the first thing we did um and i think this was sam hake who went on to work for the abc and network 10 and stuff but um she she did interviews with media buyers with lots of interviews with media buyers and asked them like how do you make your decisions and and what knowledge do you use and and that was quite motivating because if, to summarize that research an awful lot of people went I don't know. I, you know, the person before me gave me two weeks training before they left. You know, <laughs> we just do it like this. You know, and we realized it was really craft based. I remember when we asked about what sort of you know, scientific evidence or something was the most, the biggest thing that came up was the rule of three. You know, you got to have three exposures. 
And so he went, wow, you know, the, the most used principle is actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and there's hardly any of the hardly any principles used are the one that's most used is wrong. So we that was quite motivating. It made us feel we can make a contribution here. And um and uh yeah, so I, I don't know, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of myself as an advertising researcher, but apparently the the metrics say that that, that we are. We so I, well. I think it was good to start from that humble base. Uh, so we started just looking at basic patterns about how people buy and how people view. So in how brands grow, the, the, I, I'm, I'm quite proud of the, the advertising chapter because it it, it it says that you know advertising is not simple. It can work in multiple ways. You know, and there's something like five different mechanisms I think that are outlined there, and you know, potentially it can work in you know multiple of those things. But the dominant previous view was very much one from salespeople that advertising you know grabs a person and says you know pepsi is the choice of the new generation you know you say that coca-cola is all wrong <laughs> you know completely change your mind stop that don't buy coke anymore now buy pepsi you know when you look at the patterns of buy behavior you go, that's just fanciful that doesn't happen these religious conversions don't happen you know advertising is hitting people with a with a feather it's, it's a it's a it, you know it's a little subtle change in their memory structures. Uh, and that led to Jenny and I putting out the, the concept of mental availability and saying that the marketing literature was just attitude obsessed and wasn't noticing that it had, it, it, it just sort of assumed that awareness was something like, so awareness was something like, you know, brands like Coca-Cola don't worry about awareness anymore because, you know, everyone knows about Coca-Cola. So, you know, there's no reason to advertise unless you can do an ad that is, going to religiously convert the Pepsi drinker to you. It's nonsense. It's a constant battle for mental availability and for building, you know, new memory structures. I'll tell a funny story. I was, I was with the, the growth officer, I think it was called, chief growth officer so for, for Coca-Cola, just been appointed. And uh, I said, uh, coffee, coffee consumption has become huge and, and coffee bars, right? which is a caffeine drink, is a drinking situation. It's a caffeine drinking situation. And but people sit down in a Starbucks or something and they don't think of cola. <laughs> you know, to the men that you know, so you've got great awareness and things, but your mental availability in the situation is just miserable, right? You know, and that's a link you need to work on. Now I do remember, I don't know where it was, somewhere in the world they, they were starting that. They did a they had a picture of the silhouette of a, it was a black and white silhouette of a Coke bottle, and, and the words were the original long black. <laughs> which i thought that was really cool but uh the, the story uh, i thought was quite good because he he he, uh, he listened to me with a very straight face and three weeks later it was announced that coca-cola had bought uh costa coffee chain which which obviously he knew and you know there's this billion dollar purchase that you know had been probably yeah. going on for many many months uh but the, you know that's the difference between awareness and mental availability uh you you can be aware of coke but you can be in a buying situation which was like coffee shop and then just you just don't think of them then well that's a marketing problem to fix and broaden that, that mental availability and that's how advertising works by building these these memory structures that just give someone more of a chance that when they sit down in the starbucks they go actually i want some it's a bit hot i want something co- actually I'll, I'll have a coke and and you know, it's advertising that does that, that millions more people have just a little bit more chance of that. Whereas 10 years earlier, they sat down in the Starbucks and, and they didn't think of that. And you, you ask people whether advertising affects you. And of course they say, nah, not really. Because it doesn't feel like it affects you. They don't, they haven't changed their view of Coca-Cola. They haven't, they never, you know, remember sitting in front of the TV and going, oh my God, next time in Starbucks, I've got to order a Coke. It didn't work like that. It was a very subtle and, and, and so then you realize that, wow, our advertising, it needs to be like, it needs to always be on because, you know, every day people are sitting down in a consumption situation. And, and we might dive on that because that's another one of those areas where the Institute kind of challenged the convention, the idea about what the optimal or what the right flight was for advertising. Um, maybe you could share a little bit about that as well. Okay, well, that I mean, that just fits with the low propensity you know, that most of your buyers are very, very infrequent. Uh, and so, but every day someone buys, you never know when they're going to come into the market. It's, uh, 
it's it's a it's a like a, a you know, technically it's a Poisson distribution. So it, it, it you know someone can go buy 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 and then nothing below and then buy and then nothing and then buy. But yeah, it's it's like um it's like raindrops hitting a pavement. It, it, even though in every five minutes the same amount of drops may fall, when they fall, exactly the timing the intervals impossible, right? It's very random. But you know, everyday people are buying. So really, do we ever want to be off here? No, you you. As far as your budget will go, you want to always be advertised. So it took us an embarrassing long time for us to convert the research results to a, a practical principle, which was, in general, adjusting for seasonality, every month you should spend about 12, a twelfth of your budget. Every week, about a 50th. You know, it's, it's, and, you know, spread it out. It's the most important media principle is to spread out. You always get more reach for your dollar then it's very wasteful and the single source uh, research shows this and it's really great if, someone, if someone's sitting down in front of tv and they see your ad great if you hit them again tonight you don't get so much effect and well that's fine if you've got a massive budget but if you haven't got a massive budget you better to save that second exposure for tomorrow or next week or or another person some people say to us, the Irving Bass Institute's had such a huge in, influence on practice, but I actually use that as one example of going, really? I don't think so, because you watch, you watch TV tonight or listen to radio or whatever, you'll, you'll, see, you'll hear or see the same ad multiple times. And then a week later, do it, and you won't, you won't see that ad at all. Yeah, I, I think there has definitely been a convention that, you know, uh, that it's, it's, it's almost wasteful to do what you're describing, Byron, you know, which is it's wasteful to spread it out and that the more effective thing to do is to concentrate in little bursts, even if that means you only might have four bursts in a year, you know, focus yeah. and get those four bursts and then, and don't worry about it because it's so effective that it's going to, but as, as you say, it, that it's, it's going to work by magic and the other times for the people that never saw it. The people who never, never saw your ad because you didn't get that much reach will somehow be magically affected by the people who saw it eight times. But I mean, the assumption here is also that there's a minimum frequency required for any effect to happen in the first place. And that if you don't get sufficient frequency, you're essentially wasting your money. And I mean, there are companies that specialize in providing the recipes for these minimum spend levels. Uh, look, this really dawned on me when I saw a tracking company present to you know, a major client, and they, and they showed this, you know, you've got to have you know this many GRPs or something, you know, and I went, that's just your, it's your method. It's because you interview, you know, 50 people every week and then you aggregate the data up and, and, and smooth it. So you need a big turn on on advertising and a big turn off for your needle to move. And then you translate that to a recommendation to the client of, you, you, you know, GRPs below, basically what you're saying is GRPs below this level don't work. I think the the curse also of the GRP, you know, I I, I hate the um, I hate the metric, and one of the reasons I hate it is because by by inherent in it is this assumption that frequency and reach are one and the same. You know, you you you, you report them both equally, and of course, getting reach is wonderful, but getting frequency, you know, that's it's not the same as reach. It's something very very different in character, and. Yeah. You know, you can achieve the same GRP with very little reach and very high frequency with very little effect, you know. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things going back, though, well, to the evidence. Certain, certain media like, you know, like radio, things love the frequency idea because they could deliver frequency really, really well. And uh, right. the, the idea that people might not want it and, and, and might want a discount for lots of frequency. Going back to the evidence, because again, I think what makes Ehrenberg Bass work, you know, the, the, the secret to its success ultimately is, is at the end of the day, it's evidence, you know, the evidence-based uh, approach. You know, I think one of the, the things that you've achieved, which has been instrumental to your, your rise and your growth has been the access to single source data in particular. You know, that, that single source data has been such a valuable kind of like component of the evidence that you've been able to, you know, to, to, to put forward around questions like, you know, what, what is the impact of flight, you know? Yeah. We still need the world still, you know, all these people talking about how we've got lots of wonderful data. We don't have, we have near enough 
single source data. Uh, Absolutely. Sorry, sorry, by single source, what I mean is that you are measuring for the same individual, their advertising exposure and their behavior. And and we need better than, we need even more than that. We, we, need, we need data on like their consumption because, you know, sometimes the effect of an ad is that you then go to the fridge and pull something out of the fridge. Uh, right. Or or that it makes you remember the thing that you just pulled out of the fridge. The advertising reminds you that that was actually the brand name. It's a great point. It's a great point. You know, for all the data that is multiplying exponentially, it's remarkable how little good data is actually growing in that mix. <laughs> but you know, too, one of the too much stuff that's it's too much stuff that's siloed, or that's brought together by only statistical means. So the the you know, it's not it's not single source really. It's not the same individual. One of the things that Ehrenberg Bass has achieved, uh, which I think other academic research centers would really benefit from learning from, is the relationship that you've been able to build with your sponsors. You know, oftentimes the way that that would work in, in, in terms of an interchange between industry and academia would be that, you know, academics would do their own research, kind of, and then they would kind of like pitch that or ask the industry to sponsor it or, or something along those lines. But, but one of the things that's remarkable about what you were able to do is you were able to build relationships where those brands trusted you enough to share their data with you. And, you know, again, you, you, you built these unique relationships, which have a publishing dimension to them, but which also provide for confidentiality around, you know, certain layers of that research. Obviously, nobody's going to share that information if, if not. How have you been able to go to a brand and to gain access to their, their golden jewels, you know, this, this incredibly expensive and valuable data that they have around, you know, the performance of their product in the market and stuff. How have you been able to convince so many, in many cases, competing brands even, right, to share yeah, that well, data with you? You know, I remember the first work we did on, on share of voice, share of market relationship and a very large soft drink company that I won't name said, you know, we'd like to look at this. We'd like to know about spending our budgets and knowing how much we're doing. And we went, well, you must have like, you know, Nielsen type data and tracking advertising. Yep, great. Yes, excellent. But then as soon as they went to their, you know, provider of that sort of data, who they presumably pay hundreds of millions of dollars a year to, that provider went, oh, you want what? Five years? We archive it after three. Archive is a euphemistic term for meaning it's gone. Uh, so there are practical things that actually are quite hard to, to get data. And I think a lot of people in the industry sort of realize this too, that they, when they say they've lots of data, they're like, well, it's all over the place, it's messy, or it's lost, or we're not getting very much value from it, I think is the, probably the biggest thing. Yeah. And so you know, they're willing to give over data because they go, there's enormous data that could be worth something, but actually it isn't at the moment. And if you could make it worth something that turned it into something that was that we can help make decisions on that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, there there have been brands, for example, who were well known in the industry for maintaining these single source panels, and then they they walked away from it. I always found that very very odd. What what do you think motivated that that decision? You're talking I mean, about obviously it was expensive. You talking about the collapse of Project Apollo, which was uh, oh, that was one for sure. <laughs> yes. That was a good example of. Well, there's all sorts of different things. I mean, it depended on two rival research agencies working yeah. together. And you could say that neither of them had a great vested interest in it surviving, but they did it because PNG and others, you know, sort of told them to. Yes, it was very expensive, but that doesn't matter if you're getting value out of it. But I don't think people people hadn't done their homework, first of all, to work out what the value was. They hadn't they hadn't even, you know, educated the marketers to what sort of questions can you solve with this? So at a certain point, it's like, well, wait on, this is, what? you know, the next stage of this will cost $100 million. You don't even know what to do with the data that's come out of the, so far. So that's one of the agendas of the Emory Bass Institute to explain to people the power of single source data and being able to test your creativity and then start to learn about media principles. And when people understand that, then there'll be a lot, it'll be a lot easier to justify spending the money to, to, to gain that sort of data. Because, you know, things to record what people are doing are getting more and more ubiquitous and 
much cheaper. You know, we've got lots more non-invasive ways of measuring consumer behaviour. We say, you know, we don't require them to do work and we don't require them to fill in surveys. Now, Byron, these days there's a lot of shift maybe in prioritization for performance-based measures. You know, if you think about brand equity, brand equity is probably suffering in the mix, I would say, as uh, you know, particularly because of the ways in which it's measured, there has been this movement towards the things that are more easily measured, and that is leading to more performance measured objectives, if you will. But it, it, it seems, and certainly a lot of the work that we've done is, is highlighting that this is hugely problematic for a brand, that, that brands are actually making a colossal mistake, which they won't fully appreciate or understand because of the length of time that it takes for these effects to kind of like show up. Um, what, what is your research at the uh, Ehrenberg Bass showing on this, on this really crucial question around you know, brand equity versus performance metrics? We were on a bit of an agenda at the moment to try to clear up this misunderstanding between you know, performance and activation. Terrible word, activation. It's like, <laughs> you know, like the, it implies that, you know, that, that, you, that I can say something like 20% off lawnmowers this month to you, who is not in the market, I'm assuming, for a lawnmower, because most of us aren't any time, but suddenly you're activated. And <laughs> there's just no way, no way you can activate someone who's not in the market for a lawnmower. That sort of stuff is like what salespeople used to do with this, this in-store displays and things. Someone has walked up to the fridge or the shelf because they want to buy the category. And, and your Google search or your, your performance advertising is about trying to capture your, you know, more than your fair share. You know, you're a 10% brand. Well, no, you want to grab 12% or 15% of the people who are coming there. You're not activating them. You're just trying to <laughs> grab them at the last, at the last moment. There's that stuff. And then there's that we know that we do something else that helps expand the category and helps expand our long-term market share and reaches people who, you know, aren't in the market yet. And and the problem is we we always we never really knew how that worked. And so we called it this mysterious, you know, brand equity thing. Something about, oh, well, this is this is gonna make people, it's gonna make our brand cool or uh, it's going to make people feel better about it. And I think, you know, a lot of CFOs and CEOs went, so basically you're telling me it's unmeasurable mumbo jumbo and I've just got to trust you. They didn't like yeah. that. They didn't like that. And then they like the performance stuff because at least, you know, it's measurable. But, you know, the difference is the real advertising is 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 reaching brains that aren't in the market for an old mower now. And it's just, you know, subtly laying down some memory structures. So when they do... It'll help the performance stuff, right? Because when the ad bounces up on your screen, you go, oh, I, I know that brand. So it'll help that work. But also people, you know, still an enormous amount of buying is, is done on memory. Lots of us don't like McDonald's. I don't really like McDonald's food. <laughs> we hardly ever buy McDonald's. But we do actually know a hell of a lot about McDonald's. And it does mean that occasionally, uh, yeah, we buy McDonald's. I mean, I know a lot of, I'm a very, very infrequent McDonald's. Guy, but I know... I know what's on their menu. I know pretty much how the prices work. Um, I, you know, I know where that where they. I know where their stores are. I know which ones have parking. I know that they have toilets. You know, it's like wow. You know, you're a pretty infrequent buyer. Like yeah, well, McDonald's has done a really great job with its advertising. It is. It's got fantastic mental availability. It's even taught people we can have breakfast at McDonald's now. Yeah. It's taught people we can get coffee at McDonald's now. That's what um, advertising does. Not not oh, you know. I mean, McDonald's also does, you know, performance thing, which is, you know, one dollar shakes this week. But that only catches people who are, you know, really walking past the store. You know, a- another area where the institute holds somewhat controversial views, perhaps, is in the the promise that uh, that industry is currently really excited about around addressable advertising. You haven't been as enthusiastic about addressability. Uh, wh- wh- why is that? For an awful lot of brands, they don't. You don't need an awful lot of targeting. You know, I mean, your segmentation should be big, obvious things. If it's not big, obvious things that affect buying behavior, then they're not practical and useful. You know, no one, oh, I think no one, you know, puts into their segmentation, you know, length of fingernails, unless maybe you're selling nail polish or something. You know, because we go. Length of fingernails is not going to affect your, you know, credit card purchase or preference or what what size car you have or you know. We only use big practical things, and the big practical things tend to be the really most important is where do people live, 
So addressability is pretty good for that. It's cool. It gives us geographical targeting things, which, uh, yeah, that, that, that's great. Then, you know, for some brands, gender matters. You know, like you're selling men's clothing, women's clothing, but for, for a lot of brands, it doesn't matter how many people are in the household or how much money they have, or if you're a B2B marketer, you know, how many employees does that company have? How, what's its turnover? These are, you know, these are big things. And then after that, usually, you know, there's not really that much that you, you, know, you, know, you really need. So if you're selling, I think Bruce McCall said this well from Mars, and he said, we're, we're selling to about, there's about 7 billion people on the planet. When you look at the stuff we sell, we can sell it to pretty much all of them. I mean, you could go, well, you're not going to buy dog food if you don't have a dog. But you go, but even people who don't have a dog are probably going to have one in the future. So uh, we, 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 we pretty much like to reach everyone. So we're not going to do a lot of targeting. We will do some customization. We're obviously going to do, you know, in Brazil, the ads will be in Portuguese. In Canada, they'll be in English. But, uh, you know, in Quebec, maybe they'll be in French. We'll do that, those big things. So no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not anti-addressability, but... Uh, I saw a thing from Dun Humby and Tesco that they, 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 they analyzed something like 10,000 DNA, and that D, they call it DNA, which is just, you know, sciencing up stuff. What they mean is, you know, characteristics about the household and the person. I'm like, you don't need 10,000. You need where do they live? How many mouths in the house? You mentioned the dog food example. Um, certainly, I think that is the, the holy grail that most, uh, most advertisers who look at addressability seem to be pursuing, which is that assumption, again, of, of getting the category buyers, you know, targeting the category yeah, buyers, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to put an ad to someone who doesn't have a dog or a cat. I don't want to have an ad but to a person who doesn't have a dog, yeah. And, and yeah, the assumption when we, when often is that- panel data, so ask anyone, ask anyone in, in the pet food industry, go look at some panel data, and some of them may have done this already, and they, they're quite shocked about how many people at the end of the year, like have a pet that didn't have one at the start of the year, or they had one at the start of the year, but they don't have one at the end of the year. Right. It's, uh, you know, it's quite a lot of turnover in that. And then there are people who still buy pet food for, you know, because their neighbor has asked them to feed the cat or so right, it's a right. pretty broad, a good point. usually a broader market than, than you think. I like using the example of luxury watches. You know, you'd think luxury watches would only, you know, these are watches that cost like, you know, 15,000 euro plus. And you think, well, you know, who, who's going to, they could buy a car for that. So who's going to buy, who's going to buy that? It's only billionaires, right? So you'd think that if you're a luxury watch marketer, you'd put ads in what? First class lounges of airports and then pretty much anywhere else would be wastage, right? So people like me would never see a luxury watch ad. I, have, I see lots of luxury watch ads. Oh, no, clearly they go quite broad. And the reason they go quite broad is they go, yeah, billionaires are more likely to buy a luxury watch, but there's only a few thousand of them on the planet. Most of our sales go to people who aren't billionaires. And we don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. But some people just like really beautiful crafted watches. Some people go, I'd never buy a luxury car, but they've got a beautiful luxury watch. The real world is a weird place. Human beings are delightfully unpredictable. Uh, so you can get carried away of thinking that if you have more and more little, little segmentation variables, you're going to be able to predict better. But all the forecasting scientists tell you, mm, no, you're not. Go for simple. Simple models predict. Yeah, which is why if you're if you're a luxury watch manufacturer and you decide to just try to do hyper targeting on you know only people have bought one before or something, that's a really good way to you know shrink market share. Many of the interviews that I've done certainly to date have been people who've retired, you know, legends who have retired from the industry. Of course, you're still in your prime. You know, you still have a, a lot of juice left in you to squeeze, so to speak. <laughs> what's well. what's next? What what is on your what is on your horizon? You've you've achieved so much in your career to date. You know, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute is is has really evolved and, and it really has uh, an enormous impact on the industry. Um, you know, wh where to from here? What's what's next for you? Well, in the media area, and this is something we, we need to do something together on, Dwayne, we need, we need to get people to understand what attention is and what it is not. The reality of the world, the advertising world, is that we live in a world of fleeting exposures. Yeah, really, most advertising is very fleeting exposures. And we need to understand, well, when does fleeting work and when does it not? We don't even really know, you know, like how many people who walk along past a bus shelter ad actually registered. Yeah, do we? Sort of uh, the analogy I do is it's like um, it's like chefs, you know, chefs from thousands of restaurants every day going out to the markets, you know, to buy produce to take back to the kitchens. 
and yet they're like not allowed to see the fruit or you know there's like here's strawberries well you know how much do they cost um it's a dollar per galulium what's a galulium oh no it's a special metric we made up and we're not telling you well how much is it by kilo i oh, know well you can't do it by kilo <laughs> what i don't even know what i'm getting <laughs> Most of the time, we know we're getting space, or maybe we know we're getting an exposure. But you go, but but I buy these to affect brains. You know, I'm, I'm doing this to nudge memory. That's what I'm really buying, right? When I'm when I do advertising. How does this how does this radio ad affect a memory compared to this billboard? And they're sold in different markets with different weight things. So there's still a lot of mysteries. Still a lot yeah, that's unknown. A lot, lot, lot of mystery. And, I, and, and uh, there are some people running around saying that they can, they can give you the answer to all of this with, you know, one statistical model or one uh, artificial intelligence driven. It's not. It, this is going to require a hard slog and lots, of, lots and lots of bits of research to, to push the puzzle together. There's no magic bullet answer to this question. It's going to require lots and lots of different research. What advice would you give to this new generation of, you know, advertising, media, marketing researchers? What would your advice be to this new generation of researchers? Well, I was asked by a CEO and she said, we're, we're, we're doing this global search for a, a chief marketing officer. And uh, she said, what's your advice? What should we be looking for? You know, what, 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 what like new technical skills and things do, do we need? And I said, there's a huge industry out there that sells things to marketers that marketers can tap into right there's all these people who have these technical skills don't worry about getting someone who's you know a particular digital skill or something don't worry find someone who is educated but you know open-minded but skeptical you know really you know classic sort of science thing so that they don't get suckered in by the snake oil merchants but you want someone who's laser focused on the business needs on the big goals and then they'll find ways of implementing it. And so I think that's my advice to younger people, right? Learn the fundamentals, learn how to speak and explain things to other people. You know, there will be certain technical skills, you, you, you know, but you know, adding, adding more and more of those, you'll be able to link it with other people. Look, there's no one in Apple. There's probably no one single person who knows how to build an iPhone. But, but, they, but iPhones get produced and they're millions. We're very good at assembling people together and uh in marketing we do that all the time we assemble teams of people who have all sorts of different skills so yeah learn the fundamentals and and learn how to learn learn how to how would i work that out someone's making this pitch to me how would i work out that this is this is correct or not how would i work that out having the um humility to ask that question and some capacity to answer it that, that's much more important than, than technical skills So Byron, thanks for sharing your insights with us today. I think you've given all of us a lot to think about, and I'm sure some will be somewhat uncomfortable as they grapple with some of the ideas that you've been advocating. Some will probably wish they never tuned in in the first place (laughs) because it's hard to unhear what you've heard. Just doing a quick recap of some of the controversial ground we've covered today. You've challenged the Pareto principle of targeting, probably the single most important principle in ad targeting. You've rejected the widely held belief that you need at least three exposures for an ad to register. Again, probably the most important principle for media planning. You reject the practice of concentrating media spend and focus bursts, instead advocating that budgets be spread out to maximize reach. You voice concern for marketeers favoring performance and activation investment over brand equity building. And you've questioned advertising's new holy grail around addressability, particularly around its assumption for targeting based on category usage. I mean, that's a lot of ground to cover in one episode. (laughs) But seriously, thank you for joining us today. Of course, we're huge fans of yours at Media Science. Media Science and the Institute collaborate extensively. We've endowed a professorial chair at the Institute, and it's a collaboration that has been incredibly effective, not only in the work we do together for industry, but in the research we do in the academic arenas as well. In fact, a recent meta-analysis of the past 60 years of the Journal of Advertising Research identified the collaboration between media science and the Institute as the most effective in terms of co-authorship 
in the entire history of the journal. So it's a true collaboration. So as I say, Byron, we're huge fans and I'm thrilled you could join us today. And I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. Remember to follow or subscribe to our podcast, tell your friends about us, leave your ratings and comments, and stick around after the podcast for more information about media science. So until our next episode, I'm Dr. Dwayne Varon, CEO of Media Science, thanking you for joining us today and inviting you to our next episode of Legends of Media Research. Almost every major innovation in the TV advertising industry over the course of the past decade was first tested by media science researchers. Whether you're talking about video ads on mobile phones, or limited interruption ad pods, or program context effects, or brand integrations, or pause ads, or picture-in-picture -picture ads, or six-second ads, or interactive ad formats. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on and on. All were first tested by Media Science. Media Science is the leader in media innovation research. So when you're looking for media or advertising innovation research, collaborate with Media Science. Learn more at mediascience.com.